In progress. This is Tuesday, June 14th, 2022. This is a work session of the Portland City Council. Today's subject is the Albina Vision Trust Community Investment Plan. Today we'll be hearing from the AVT team about the community engagement efforts they've undertaken over the past two years that led to a vision and ultimately a community plan for Lower Albina to restore some of the neighborhood fabric that's been lost, coupled with wealth building off opportunities for the African American community. As you all know, the city has been having ongoing conversations with community around this area for many years. My administration has been supportive of the community's desire to advance a community-led vision, and my administration will continue to be supportive of these efforts. We funded a portion of this visioning process through Prosper Portland and are very excited to have included $800,000 in next year's budget to support the next steps of this work. I'm looking forward to hearing about AVT's process and the community's vision as well as starting the conversation about some potential next steps for continued partnership. My office has co-sponsored the work session today with Commissioner Rubio, so I'd like to turn it over to Commissioner Rubio for a few remarks, and then if any of my other colleagues uh, would like to make some opening remarks, you're welcome to do so. And we have Commissioner Hardesty joining us via Zoom this morning as well. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm looking forward to the presentation today by the Albina, Albina Vision Trust team and hearing from Bureau leadership as well. Um, I know this has been a very robust community engagement process and want to acknowledge and celebrate this accomplishment. Um, Albina Vision Trust is a community focused and centered and led entity and is working to acknowledge and, and reverse one chapter of our city's past wrongs and reunite this neighborhood for the community. I also want to acknowledge the community leaders and experts who've been champions of this important work. I'm honored to know so many of them um, and um, really grateful to meet new, new folks. And your deep dedication to this project really comes through. So thank you for being here today and for um, everything that each of you do every day for the community. Uh, this vision was created by and for the community, and their work aligns with so many of our city's values, and I'm impressed by this long-term, 50-year vision, which will help lay the groundwork for future efforts in this area. I look forward to hearing more about how you see your, your future work unfolding and how you envision to implement the, the vision over time. I'd also like to acknowledge and share my appreciation for two letters of support council received from the Planning and Sustainability Commission and a joint letter from the Design and Historic Landmarks Commission. I've reviewed these letters and appreciate the time that the commissions have taken to offer the thoughtful feedback on this plan. So I'll now turn it over back to the mayor's staff to get us started with today's session. And again, we just want to echo if, if there are any other comments or acknowledgements um, from our colleagues before we get started. And Commissioner Hardesty, just raise your hand if you wanted to speak. Good, looks like we're good to go. And so with that, we will jump in with Winta Johannes. She's the Executive Director of the Albina Vision Trust and certainly a familiar figure to those of us here at City Hall. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. I will actually pass it to Christina to kick us off. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Christina again. I'm a member of the Mayor's team and I'm going to be helping facilitate uh, today's work session. I think we have some slides we're going to pull up here really quickly. Um, as that gets up, I will start going over today's agenda. Um, we have Eric Engstrom here from the city's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, who's gonna provide a quick background on this work and some of the city's history in the area. Then the Alpine Vision Trust team, Winta and others, will present their community investment plan, including their community engagement process they went through over the past two years, their physical plan for the area and their vision for the phases of implementation and wealth building strategies. We will pause at a few points throughout the presentation so council can ask any clarifying questions. Then Lisa Abwaf from Prosper Portland, Eric Ingstrom again from BPS, and Art Pierce from PBOT will provide a bit more information on related City of Portland initiatives and potential areas of alignment for future city work in partnership with ABT. And then at the end, 
Um, we'll open it up for a broader council discussion and Q&A with the ABT team. I'll be monitoring time through the work session. We have staff from several bureaus on the call and in the room with us today, as well as additional members of the ABT team. If there are questions, they may be able to help answer. And with that, I'd like to turn over over to Eric Engstrom from BPS. Uh, uh, Christina, director. before you move along, and, and sorry, I didn't quite read my outline properly. So, Winter, I hope I hope you didn't panic when I called on you right away. <laughs> um, thank you, Christina, for for facilitating today. I appreciate it. Uh, and Eric, I know your presentation will be great as always. Um, could you also monitor the uh, the Zoom? And if somebody has a question, can we rely on you to to facilitate? Yes, happy that? to do that. Okay, thanks. I appreciate it. All right, Eric. All right. Good morning. Can folks on Zoom hear me in the mic? I can't see them, so I'm going to assume they can. Um, good morning. My name is Eric Kingstrom. I'm with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. BPS has appreciated the opportunity and privilege to build stronger relationships with Albina Vision Trust over the past several years as they develop the vision that you'll hear about today. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Rachel Hoy and Amy Negi in the room who were instrumental in a lot of the city ABT coordination. Um, my brief role this morning is just to set the context for this presentation. Uh, and then Lisa Art and I will share uh, later how this relates to several other city initiatives after ABT's um, presentation. Uh, over the past few months, leadership in several bureaus have received briefings from AVT on this plan, and we've started the process of understanding what it might mean for us in the future. Uh, the vision being presented today here is the result of a community-led process, and while Rachel and Amy were, have been at the table to help connect the dots to city work, this was not a BPS or a Prosper-led initiative. It's been community-led. The plan provides an innovative vision prioritizing black community and wealth building opportunities in Lower Albina. Uh, at this stage, it's similar to what we might call a concept plan or a framework plan. Um, potential next steps in our collaboration and partnership might be to fill in the kinds of details that are needed when we take a concept plan and turn it into legislation with specific implementation plans that can be considered by the city. Um, as I mentioned, this is not a city-led plan, but it's. Uh, and it's not being presented to you today for adoption, this is an introduction. Um, that said, at the very high level, this vision shares many goals with the city adopted plans for the area with, and with further collaboration can help advance city goals. We expect a lot of change in the central city and the northeast quadrant over the next 20 years. Um, of the projected 123,000 new housing units that we're trying to accommodate citywide over the next 20 years, almost 8,000 would be in the Northeast Quadrant. And AVT's vision is a key part of the Central City Northeast Quadrant um, implementation and, and can help us reach those goals. The AVT vision also embodies city policy that supports communities impacted by involuntary displacement, helps uh, reestablish a stable presence and participation in impacted neighborhoods. Next slide, please. This slide shows some key milestones in the recent past. And of course, there's a deeper history here that AVT may get into. But just over the past decade, uh, looking back to 2012, the city adopted the Northeast Quadrant Plan for this area uh, with the Central City's Lloyd District. In 2014, uh, Mayor Hales asked the community to lead a visioning process, and AVT was formed. Um, also during this time, the North Northeast housing strategy was created. In 2016, the comprehensive plan was adopted with new policy and direction to ensure Portlanders more equitable share of benefits and burdens of growth and development. During this time, the North Northeast Development Initiative also allocated 32 million focusing on prosperity for communities of color. And the city adopted the Central City 2035 plan, which updated goals and policies for Portland's Central City. More recently, in 2020, AVT was awarded a Metro planning grant with additional support from the city through Prosper Portland uh, to support this community-led process. The grant supported collaboration between AVT and city staff. The city has supported this work in a number of ways, including providing data and mapping resources, responding to city policy questions, organizing opportunities for bureau staff and leadership to meet with AVT and offer our ideas, uh, BPS also participated in a monthly Metro City meeting with AVT to, to discuss the progress. And in 2021, the city through PHB awarded Albina Vision Trust 13 million for the Albina One uh, affordable housing project. Next slide. 
The image to the left shows the part of the Northeast District that aligns with the AVT vision for context. And the map on the right zooms in more to this area and shows the current ownership pattern. The map has been simplified a bit, but it reflects a pretty complex geography with a lot of different owners. There's city-owned land here, there's railroad land, state land, school district, TriMet, and there are about a dozen other private property owners in the mix. So in summary, this is a complex ownership pattern with significant public investment and private investment in the area. The takeaway from my part of the presentation, again, is that this is not a city-led initiative and there would be more work ahead to embed the vision into city-adopted plans. But at a high level, the vision shares many goals with city-adopted plans for the area and with collaboration can help advance those goals. And I'll turn it back to Christina. Thank you, Eric. Um, yes, does Council have any questions? Switch me to, thank you, Mr. Mayor. They switched me to a different mic. Um, what are, let me, I'll start over. Uh, Eric, thanks for the presentation. Um, what are the planning documents that the city has developed that are relevant to this space? So am I mostly looking at the comp plan or are there other neighborhood specific plans that come into play here? Um, Sure, it's a bit of a nested arrangement. At the citywide level, we have the comprehensive plan, which has policy and, and governs the zoning map. At the local level, you have the central city plan, which, and then within that, you have the northeast quadrant of the central city plan, which has more neighborhood-specific goals and, and policies. Uh, thank you very much. At some point before we're done today, I'd love to hear how this project either uh, fits, complements, extends, requires some changes to the other plans that we have on the table, but we don't have to do that right now. Awesome. Okay, any other questions before we pass off to Winton and our team? All right, well then I'd like to welcome Winta Johannes, Executive Director of the Alpine Division Trust, to introduce herself and her team joining us here in City Hall and on Zoom today. Thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. So uh, I'm glad to be joined today by Zary Santner and Len Bergstein from our team. And what a wonderful occasion to be back in city council chambers. So let's go ahead and pull up the presentation, please. Next slide. Okay, so I'd like to give a little bit of an overview uh, before I introduce the team and dive into the presentation itself. As you know, the Albina vision was born out of a simple observation. Lower Albina is ripe for redevelopment and there's an opportunity here to witness the changes that will happen or to influence them. We chose the latter and anchored in our thinking are the following truths. The landscape in Lower Albina tells the story of how systematically and deliberately we have destroyed the physical heart of the historic black community. The landscape also represents unparalleled opportunity to choose a different trajectory for the next generation if we proactively make different choices about who and what we value. To do this, we can not sell the future of Lower Albina to the highest bidder or even the most generous developer with who, from whom we could squeeze the most community benefits. Instead, we need to start with what we hope to accomplish. We need to design and invest for the safety and prosperity of black and brown children and work backwards from there. This is the charge that we gave to the community investment plan team. Along with their charge, we also asked them to help us connect Eastsiders to the waterfront once again, to create a central city neighborhood that will be an attraction for all Portlanders to enjoy, and a set of strategies that take us from aspirational values to concrete next steps towards implementation. Now, at stake and under this council's watch will be the opportunity to claim the last opportunity for working class Portlanders to significantly own a part of the city. We know that reckoning with the 20th century urban renewal ramifications, uh, including infrastructure that has continued to divide and scar, is something that cities all over the country are grappling with. 
And in some cases, we are ahead of the curve by thinking for many years now about how we will reckon with that history and charge a different uh, path forward. Yet, when we look outside in Lower Albina, we see tents where homes used to be. In Portland, we see a struggle for civic pride and collective healing. We see missing opportunities for generational wealth for black Portlanders who have been systematically robbed. We have a lot of work to do. And yet, we have started that work together with you, the city council. On the I-5 Rose Quarter Improvement Project, you stood with us and said, not on our watch will we see highways continue to destroy communities. On Albina One, you helped us make steps towards our first move as property owners and developers in the district. And through your decision on this year's budget, we'll be able to advance our efforts to acquire land and continue the master planning that needs to happen. So we're here today at this work session to say, let's take it all the way to the altar and make it official. Let's start the hard work of reconciling where our work uh, aligns with the cities. And what we're asking from you is acknowledgement and affirmative support for the long-term commitment that it will take to make this vision a reality. And so on the screen here, you see the members of the Community Investment Plan. This is a world-class team led by El Dorado Architects. And we've assembled this team with the notion that we needed holistic, cross-disciplinary thinkers with both local and national roots. We asked them to produce from the initial guiding set of values a plan that begins to articulate how we can have investment without displacement, how we can remain ambitious while setting an achievable path towards implementation, how we can generate wealth building opportunities for everyday Portlanders through the creation of a new neighborhood, and how to build trust through creative and authentic engagement. They delivered, and we are proud that the community <laughs> investment plan begins to show how we can stop memorializing Albina and instead create a living monument to what's possible when we choose justice and embed it into the city's very fabric. And so for today's presentation, next slide please, we have we know there's a lot of content, so we've um, split the discussion into three sections. You'll hear a little bit more about the engagement. We'll pause for questions. You'll hear about the physical plan with another break for questions, and then we will conclude uh, with the final section being about the wealth building strategies proposed. Each section will be five to se or seven to 10 minutes, so I'll ask you to hold your question until uh, the end of each section. And with that, I will introduce Kane Talton Davis and Cleo Davis, who will provide us with an overview uh, and start walking us through the engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Winta, and good morning, uh, council members. Yes, good morning. Um, so as Winta mentioned, we'll take a quick walk uh, through some of the history of Albina. So um, what we're seeing here are Many of the pictures of the historic black community that uh, once was thriving within Albina. Um, not only do we have houses that were um, in our first picture displaced by the building of the freeway and um, Memorial Coliseum at the time, but before that, um, we have so many uh, thoughts and ideas and memories that are just of a vibrant community uh, where there were churches and um, community coming together to better the area and um, really working together in order to make a better neighborhood, a better district, and a better environment for everyone who lived within it. So looking at these pictures again, we have um, children from the neighborhood, uh, some of the early urban renewal um, efforts, a, some of the gardening efforts that took place, uh, different cultural events, and really we're seeing just a, a number of, a snippet of the number of activities that went on in North, North, North Northeast and in Albina. Next slide, please. And so what we have here is first, we're looking at 
what that community used to look like from an aerial, aerial view. So in 1948, we had really that neighborhood feel. Um, people could go next door to their neighbors, talk, sit, chat out on the front porch, and really feel like they were a community. Um, with the change in infrastructure as far as the Memorial Coliseum and the freeway, amongst other things, uh, really decimating that community physically. Uh, we lost an incredible number of homes, businesses, and a greater sense of community. So just looking at the changes from 1948 to 1962 and to what it looks like today. And then I'm turning this over to Mark and Mike. Thanks, Kayeen. Um, my name is Mike Wilkerson, uh, Echo Northwest. Uh, thanks for your time, um, Mr. Mayor and, and counselors. Uh, the scope of this project was not focused on documenting the wealth lost in the community through the many actions that decimated what was once a thriving community and neighborhood. Uh, this shared history, however, is foundational to the engagement process in this project and provides contextualization for why building wealth for the Black community is a guiding principle for this vision. Calculating intergenerational wealth loss is not a straightforward exercise. The complexity manifests in many ways uh, and the many ways in which wealth can be measured. In its narrowest definition of wealth using dollars, we can look at the 800 homes that were lost. And by doing something like a counterfactual, say, you know, what would these homes have been worth today? And the characteristics and attributes of the historic Albina neighborhood uh, would put it near the top of the value in terms of propositions for things like location, uh, proximity to jobs, walkability, uh, thriving mix of uses, et cetera. And we can look at other nearby neighborhoods here, you know, as an example, look at an adjacent neighborhood in Irvington and look at what those value of those 800 homes would have been today. And it puts the value in the, in the neighborhood of a billion or more dollars in terms of what that loss would be. And again, that's just looking at uh, a narrow focus of the value of the homes, not the impact of what that would have been cumulatively over generations. Next slide. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Bree Hensold with Agency, part of the uh, design team, and just wanted to orient everyone to the study area for the project, which I think you all know quite well, but encompasses really centrally located land that links the Steel Bridge and the Portland Public School site, the Willamette River, and I-5. And I think the marks of the last 50 years of urban renewal that Winta and others mentioned are really clearly visible from this view today with large entertainment uses, impervious surface parking, and industrial and mixed commercial uses. Next slide. And instead, the community-driven future vision we're gonna tell you about today imagines a new neighborhood that is immersed in a range of green park spaces that will seamlessly connect that river to a new mixed use and mixed density uh, neighborhood and buildings. It's a place where sustained affordability, livability, and diversity can provide long-term value to Lower Albina, while a series of hubs that we'll talk a lot about will create community spaces to connect across generations. And back to Kane. Thanks, Bree. Uh, so what we did with our uh, community outreach and engagement was really a little bit different from one, what one might find uh, in many other um, outreach proposals. Um, we took a number of different hosts and community collaborators and really stepped out into different areas. So instead of working with just a couple people to um, lead our different workshops and, and meetings and talk to different groups along the way, we went on ahead and found multiple community hosts in order to reach out to different groups of people and be able to talk to folks that aren't usually involved in this kind of community engagement. Uh, we were also able to uh, talk to people who, while often involved in community engagement, maybe had a different perspective from what um, much of the group was talking about. And we were able to talk to them in such a way that ideas were able to change, people were able to come together and come to a consensus of what this future of Albina might look like. So as you can see, we have here in the community hosts and collaborators, 
um, people from across the section of a cross section of community, entertainers, um, politics, artists, activists, um, economic advisors, so really just educators, um, a really good group of people we were able to directly reach out to and then reach out to the people within their communities. Next slide, please. Um, part of the way that we were making sure to reach out was to do so with graphics that represented the community and represented the joy that we really wanted to bring to this project. Um, so focus on black joy and Afrofuturism, really making sure to not only base it in some of the history, uh, but also looking towards the future and make sure that people felt that they were part of the process. One way that we did that work was having multiple different sessions for each workshop. Our first section was dedicated to the Black community, making sure that voices were heard that are not usually heard, um, making sure experiences were shared, um, and any input that we had from the Black community was able to be translated into um, additional workshops to make sure that it passed that bar first. Um, and this is this is an example of you know this is one of my favorite uh, work sessions because what we did was we asked about what a what a if you could have a choice what would your island look like and so many people were able to we put this together to where you were able to draw hold pictures up um, send in images and. Um, so uh, draw, hold pictures up, send in images, also email any kind of additional comments. Um, this workshop was one of our um, one of our workshops that had the most youth attendance. So we really wanted to make sure that we pulled in a lot of young folks who actually be living here in the next 50 years um, and what their ideas were for what that future look, looked like. And so you're seeing some of their pictures, some pictures from adults. So we're definitely more polished as we did eventually have uh, some architects and some city planners involved. But some of my favorite ones included ideas about sand castles and using sand dollars as currency. So really having that breadth of, of ideas and, and thought processes was very valuable to this process. It really helped to identify a lot of the values that the community had as far as intergenerational living, access to green spaces, as well as uh, education and economic development within the community. And so at the bottom, you see 18 community workshop sessions. That was six workshops split into three sessions each, 563 attendees, um, 163 pieces of visual input, and 30,000 words of feedback. And so really just looking at that as engagement as every single step of the sign. Well, well said. So again, getting into looking at those values that were highlighted within um, the different snapshots of community and seeing, you see some of those little hands from, from our children that participated um, and just the thoughts about what, what came from the community and community thought processes. This, this was a very exciting process because this hasn't been done before to where you can gather folks together and be able to um, express, you know, in real time from a generational perspective of a, of a whole vision. And we're gonna turn it over to Othello to... Sure. So Thanks, uh, Tina Cleo. This is Othello Meadows with the Meadows Group. Um, first of all, this was an uh, uh, exceptionally exciting uh, process to work in, and one that I think Portland should be aware of is, is, is really unique across the country. I participate in a lot of these types of, of, of processes, and, and this is one that has been uh, easily the most resident-led and uh, resident-empowered process that I've, that I've been a part of. Uh, this idea of the planning, the work, the idea, the thoughts coming directly from 
folks whose ancestors were most effectively, most directly affected uh, really came through in the, in the way that the, the sessions played out. Um, there was really a relentless desire to unearth every thought, every comment, uh, every set of feelings about what the future of, of, of this place should be. Uh, and I think that's really unique. Um, the idea of it being resident led um, in comparison to other places like uh, uh, Minneapolis, other places that I've worked, uh, it was really stark in the sense that the possibilities were coming directly from folks uh, who have the closest connection and the closest tie to this place and therefore should have the largest voice. Um, you know, people were able to see their thoughts, their ideas uh, populated in real time and not taken for granted, not uh, being patronized, which I think in turn made them feel much more empowered and much more involved and listened to in this process. So uh, it was one of the more powerful engagement processes that I've been a part of. You know, it all started really with framing this conversation around the assets of this community. Uh, and once that sort of framing was set, we saw residents lean in in a really authentic way where sometimes people are guarded and cautious about laying out their dreams and their hopes and their aspirations for a place if they don't feel like that conversation is, is genuine and, and, and authentic. And people, uh, we were able to get over this hurdle of gaining trust uh, and letting people really express what they thought ought to happen going forward. This is a very different process from what typically happens. What typically happens is a, a developer comes in as a pro forma and thinks about how to make those things fit within that pro forma. Um, and this occurred exactly the opposite way, thinking about what is best for people, what is best for community, what is best for families. And so it was uh, a thrilling process to be a part of. If, if you want to go back one slide, if you don't mind, I could just wrap up this section, I think, by just noting that across all of those lively and really, you know, challenging and trust building conversations that Kane and Cleo and Othello talked about, we were able to glean kind of five clear themes that people agreed upon. Um, they really felt that Albina in the future should have access to nature with a rich variety of public spaces, that it should create shared social support and perhaps most fundamentally generate wealth and a sense of belonging for the black community. And so those became sort of rallying calls for the design to respond to um, and, and achieve. And the community gave us lots of ideas about how the physical space of the neighborhood could do that to support those goals. And those ideas then became the basis for the program that we'll show you with a mix of housing, commercial and public spaces. Um, and those ideas were also um, the seed of one of the most defining elements of the neighborhood will show you this series of community hubs that will bring people together in Lower Albina um, and emphasize those shared values we heard about for art, food, and learning. And so with that, I think uh, we will pause now for discussion. Okay, and as we jump into comment, just one last note. You know, we've focused a lot on the um, engagement with the community and especially the black community, but I do want to note that this process also engaged a lot of neighborhood folks. Uh, we brought together roundtables of developers, uh, partners from philanthropy, and then partners across the public sector, both at City of Portland, Metro, and the state. So we'd be happy to share more about that engagement as well, but I want you to know that this is one part of, of the broader um, engagement. Wonderful. All right, we're going to pause here for some questions. I see questions from um, Commissioner Hardesty and from Mayor. Commissioner Hardesty? First, let me just say how disappointed I am. I'm not in the room with you all today. I am so thrilled that we are finally having this work session. Um, and I wanted to, uh, uh, the vision sounds fabulous. Uh, uh, but I, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about undoing the harm um, that previously actually split the albina community and is not part of the vision of reconnecting, re-knitting um, albina uh, back uh, 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 together. 
Absolutely. Good morning, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, I believe you're talking about um, the I-5 project and the need to undo the segregation of, of lower albina from the rest of north northeast Portland. Um, in the next part of the presentation, when we look at the plan, we will actually be able to see how that fits into this vision for lower albina. So I'll ask you uh, to let us come back to that point. I'm happy to let you do that. Um, and let me just say, uh, went to, uh, it, it is just so fabulous to see how far the Albana Vision Trust uh, vision has come. Um, and as you know, we have had a lot of uh, uh, skeptics about this vision. And it's just wonderful watching uh, the process that's creating a plan um, that uh, is just revolutionary. So I, I will stop and wait uh, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Mayor? Yeah, thank you. I have uh, just two questions. Uh, the first is related to the conversations you had in community around wealth building. And it seemed like that was a really important aspect of the overall vision. Uh, there's lots of ways to build wealth through home ownership, property ownership, through small business ownership. What, what really struck you as being some of the top priorities for the community as you did those listening sessions? You know, what I love about these questions is that the council's ready to dive into the content. So the next, uh, we will have a whole wealth building um, section oh, where we'll then, explain. Then let's hold off on that. Um, and then the, the second question I had, maybe you get to this later, obviously a portion of the proposed development area is immediately adjacent to our arenas, to our spectator venues. And I'm curious to know what conversations you've had with those particular organizations and venue operators about spectator activities and how that might work with the Albina vision. Absolutely. So, you know, the vision has to be compatible with those uses. And um, I think that the plan we're putting forward balances that. We have on our leadership council, Chris Oxley, who we consult with regularly. And through this process, we also uh, uh, presented the plan to um, OMF and PBOT, who helped us get some feedback about parking and uh, event circulation. We'll get to that in the plan presentation as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor? Um, actually, I'd like to look at a graphic um, that came up early in the presentation. I think it was the map that shows the property ownership for um, in this space. Is that easy to get to? That I think Lisa can pull that up. And actually, I mostly want to look at the map. I may actually so, uh, share or hold off on the question. Uh, while we try to pull up the map, um, no. The, how about the, I think there's a graphic that actually shows the major buildings that are in this space. Mm -hmm. And it's labeled. Maybe it came after that. Was it one of yours? Yeah. You I'll stop post. You can flip through. We're working through the technical issues here. Okay, you can, we can flip, and while we flip through the slides, um, one of the, oh, here we go, this is the, and actually I, I literally just wanna take a moment to absorb um, some of the things that are happening here. Okay. Um, and is if this I may... the whole service area, or is this the whole district that we're talking about, or is this leaving some stuff out? This is the district. Okay. Um, well, at some point, I want to revisit some of the questions that the mayor um, asked about, you know, the conversations we've had. If I, as I take a look at major infrastructure and buildings here, we got the Moda Center, we got Veterans Memorial Coliseum, we got the school district, and we have a highway. I'd love to have um, a deeper conversation about what conversations with uh, those property owners have been like. The other question um, that I'd like to bring up. Uh, now is currently how many people live in this space? So if you can see on the map um, just north of the Portland Public School site, right there, thank you. 
There is the Paramount apartment there, which is the last standing residential building in the district. That building contains 66 units, and that is the only uh, building with people actually living in it. On the parking lot adjacent to that is the site of our first project, Albina One, uh, which will contain 95 units. Okay, so right now, uh, very low residential uh, um, uh, population here. And uh, Eric, I'm gonna pick on you for a second, if I may. I thought I heard in, um, in your presentation, did you say that it was our goal to get 8,000 people living in this space? In the, in the larger northeast quadrant, so oh. that, that geography goes a little bit beyond this all the way out to the Lloyd Center. Okay. So this is a subset of that. Do we have a, area. do you have a? This is West End line. This is the West End of that area, yeah. Okay. Um, why don't I let you move on? Uh, um, uh, I'd love to get a clearer sense of um, how, um, our various planning documents and our various overlapping visions kind of fit together, but it's probably easiest to get into that as we, I let you get into it. So I Thank will. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, so the next portion of the presentation is on the physical plan, um, as Winta and her team will go over, so it will be a lot of uh, opportunity to dive into some of the, the built, current built environment and the vision for the future. Right, so let's jump into the plan um, with Sean, or I'm sorry, um, Bree, Josh, and Othello will walk us through this section. Thanks, Winter. Um, I'll, I'll just kind of tee this up and, 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 and Josh jump in here where, where you see fit. Um, you know, one of the things about this plan that uh, is unique is sort of rarely are communities invited into the conversation when you're talking about trade-offs, when you're talking about how a community actually takes take shape. Um, and it's it's a level of transparency and honesty that that communities are, are sort of rarely afforded the opportunity to take to, to benefit from. One of the things we wanted to do was to talk about with the community, like these choices that ultimately are going to be in your hands, uh, all come with different pros and cons. They all come with different upsides and downsides or, or just different choices that you'll have to live with. Um, and so we walked through a series of low density, medium density, high density options, and then had really rich conversations with the community about what that meant from a financial potential, uh, from a, a wealth creation potential, excuse me, standpoint, uh, from the amount of opportunities for small and emerging black owned businesses to participate. So each of these, uh, each of these possibilities has a different set of, of, of outcomes for that. And so this slide here, uh, and in the community meetings that we, we, we spent time in here, this was something that really captured the imagination and, and, and the attention of, of, of residents. The opportunity to weigh in on what you want a community, a neighborhood to look like with the realities of what those trade-offs are. And, you know, we couldn't have done any of this absent the work of Kaim and Cleo, as well as all the other community hosts that got us to a place where we had enough trust built up to where we could talk about pros and cons of different strategies. And so had we done that out of order, I think we would have gotten a very different sort of outcome uh, as, as it was, you know, we got to a place where this became really sort of a fun exercise for people within the community to talk about what was most important to them. Was it most important to realize to maximize the financial potential of a of a site, right? Like in the high density uh, uh, illustration, or was it more important for it to have more of a family and sort of neighborhood feel, as, as in the lower density site? Um, so that was a really kind of relationship building opportunity for the team as well as the community because we were trying to answer real questions, and I think so so often communities have these things placed upon them after these conversations have taken place somewhere else at a different time. But it was it was really fascinating to go through and try and understand, you know, what are the levers, what are the ones of these bars here on the screen that mean the most to this community? And there was tremendous debate within the community, which is how you wrestle with these problems or these opportunities 
and how you get to a solution that, that people feel good about. Uh, Josh, you want to jump in and maybe talk in a little bit more detail about, about the bars on the bottom of these illustrations? Sure, and, and we'll keep this moving, but I, I did want to say that typically, you know, I think in, within planning processes, you, you look at this from <clears throat> height restrictions or preserving view corridors, et cetera. I think what, what Othello touched on is we were looking um, at these density studies through um, the, the opportunity for, for wealth creation of, uh, for, for Black Portland. So the, the bars really, really kind of um, balanced the, the, the trade-offs um, for, for those kinds of opportunities. So if we go to the next slide. One of the great things that we realized together with the community that this site is complex enough that we didn't necessarily have to choose one neighborhood type, that we could actually imagine there being a mixture of, of density on the site. And I think that that immediate anxieties about um, hard choices early on, but, but, but this site, uh, as challenging as uh, one, one of the great assets of the site is, is the diversity. Um, of, of, of opportunity. So we talked a lot about uh, the, the full range of, of, of neighborhood choices. Um, so next slide. And you can see here, here how we started to think about the different sub areas of the bigger site as a chance to develop out those different opportunities for wealth generation and amenities and kind of have that balance of more of a complete place um, so the Portland Public School site was reserved really for kind of medium density housing and neighborhood while well, Broadway, the south corner, um, and the garages along Broadway, it was really clear that because of their adjacency to large streets, the large surrounding entertainment uses, and the desire to create a gateway into this community, they could take on higher density. Um, and then the waterfront was really debated, I think, with the community as an area of significant value. Um, and we explored a whole range of opportunities there. <coughs> we get to a fun reveal here then through that the sort of conversations about uh, the role of wealth creation in decision around um, creating a great community. You can see that ultimately the full vision that um, the design team and the community arrived at is a neighborhood that offers that broad range of densities and uses, um, which also enables it to be developed uh, more over time and make sure that the opportunity values is shared more broadly. So just a few kind of key facets of the full plan that you can see here. Um, and this is the full vision. So we're looking out to about 2050 here. Um, you see in yellow what we call what we've been calling the community hubs, and that they're threaded throughout the neighborhood. Um, and so they're connecting from a learning hub uh, in the north neighborhood to a very prominently located food hub on Broadway, an arts hub on the waterfront, and possibly a sports hub to the south. So everywhere in the neighborhood, there's a place that is community owned. Um, those hubs would be places for critical community resources for you for entrepreneurs, for residents and artists. Um, and then they're surrounded by these mixed use neighborhoods um, that create a lot of space for new jobs, for black owned businesses, new parks, walkable improved streets and improved connections both within the neighborhood, but then also beyond um, through trails and then through kind of reimagining the connection. Let's go to the next one. Um, so we get to look closer now north of Broadway. Um, you can see the key map hopefully in the front, uh, in the upper right corner, but we're taking an aerial looking south over the full neighborhood with the Willamette River on the right. Um, and what this shows is really the potential for the Pup Portland Public School building and all of its parking today to transform, opening up about six city blocks that could be um, this first great neighborhood that that neighborhood is immersed in trees and backyard open spaces. It has a mix of different housing types and they're intentionally designed in small groups so that those spaces can meet the needs of different generations um, and users. And then the next one, we'll get a view kind of southeast across the river, um, sort of like that view we went back, we started with of today, but looking really 
transformed into a place where people can live, come back to, and thrive. And so we talked about the hubs as anchors, um, but what we really heard from the community is that what will root this back, Lower Albina, in place again is when many people are living here, um, living in that close-knit neighborhood to the north, uh, starting their business, stopping it. Um, this is also a place where people imagined um, by drawing their islands or telling us in other ways uh, that you could look out your window, see your neighbors and get to know them and their families. So it's a place where community connection is really important. And part of that um, has to do with kind of the detail of the thinking that over half the units are three bedrooms for families or age-friendly living, um, three-story walk-ups that can have a low entry uh, price point, be built by black builders and fellow shows um, and welcome smaller contractors who are already in the marketplace to capture some of the value and opportunity. It's also a place this, where, yeah, Josh, go ahead. I was, I was just gonna say this, this, this rendering actually says very nicely that blended approach to density um, that, that we shared earlier where there's a medium density to the, to the north that, that we've been calling the kind of the, the tight knit neighborhood that then starts to crescendo towards, uh, towards Broadway and sort of a gateway to the, to the Albina neighborhood closer to the arenas. Yeah, and you can see how the arenas are a challenge in some way, but they actually work well with that kind of um, larger Another thing that we heard that people really wanted is that there'd be educational resources um, right in their backyard. And so we have that in the North neighborhood. They wanted immediate access to nature along the river, in the waterfront park, and wanted this to feel like an almost car-free area. So you could use your vehicle, um, but deliberately kind of leave it at the edges and not have streets that are dominated by cars, but instead by people. So we'll start to take apart that um, kind of full vision and walk through the different stages. Uh, Josh and I will do that. This, this is the catalyst phase, so looking ahead to the next 10 years. Um, and it's pretty ambitious um, because we want to set the tone of the whole neighborhood by introducing that medium density close-knit neighborhood that has the learning and arts hub on the river and in the neighborhood, and that those, those buildings and places don't feel isolated, but they're tied together by a green network of parks, of trails, of tree-lined streets, um, and of backyard green spaces. So especially, you can probably see the riverfront, both north and south of Broadway, is a big part of creating a sense of place in the neighborhood. Um, and it was really important to the community in the conversations that it become and remain shared by all. Um, so with the Art Hub anchoring the central riverfront, it gets enlivened. Imagine it full of life and art with performances, but then also a place that people can gather every day and get great views to downtown. In the next slide, um, we'll take a look down on the ground in that close-knit neighbor community again, where the buildings could be a blend of for sale townhomes, um, and homes for rent with stabilization. Um, see a lot of the green space in this neighborhood where the backyards are shared and people can spend time together in those outdoor spaces. Uh, families, um, people visiting the learning hub um, from other parts of the neighborhood or other parts of Portland. And the next one shows us that that educational hub is right in the heart of the neighborhood. So as we heard, connecting people always to learning and to future opportunities. And we'll move along the north waterfront. And we can see this is a place where new gardens bring the neighborhood um, in really close proximity to fresh food and to a place that can be quiet and, and peaceful. Um, this area of the waterfront north of Broadway is imagined to be a quiet area, a place to escape into nature or for kids to play. And then I think one of the most dynamic and kind of public um, moments is this new bridge over Interstate Avenue um, that gets you to arrive um, from the core of the neighborhood into this arts hub and waterfront park. Um, so a really dramatic arrival and the riverfront design to be much more accessible to the public than it is today with those views between the bridges, places to gather, playground, all the walk along. Of building on the adjacency to the Rose Quarter facilities too. It could be kind of a bustling celebration space, um, a little bit louder, an events lawn, um, that iconic grid. So while that park is not yet designed, it's just designed kind of through community ideas and conversations and imagined. Um, we're really excited by the potential impact of a space like this 
on creating those community connections, the sense that Lower Albina is really um, part of Portland um, and where you can also invest in health and a sense of belonging in the community. I'll pass it over to Jeff, Josh, for the next phase. Thanks, Bree. Um, so, the, a project like this is is dynamic and it's in its phasing, of course. And um, we've we've talked uh, at great length with Albina Vision Trust and stakeholders about kind of the the, the right level of vision and the, the right kind of timeline to kind of realize the sort of transformation along Broadway uh, that, that we're imagining. So uh, in 2030 to 2040, we imagine that um, the, the interstate caps would be would be fully realized. Perhaps they're, the, they're kind of in the cross hatched um, to the, to the um, top of the page. We're not showing anything because that's not in our in our purview under this study. But but um, we we know that that's an exciting addition to the to the site. We also imagine kind of the, the density that that's being proposed around Broadway to take shape. The the food hub um, being introduced as a as a major uh, gateway to the to the neighborhood and really connecting the tight knit neighborhood uh, to the arts hub and the waterfront park. So if we go to the to the next slide. And I'm sorry, there's a little bit of a lag on my screen. Can everyone see the next, the rendering of the food hub? Yep. Yes. Okay. So um, the, the food hub itself, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is the Albina market. Um, this, with, with the introduction of, of uh, density, we imagine creating um, hybrid streets where streets can also transform into. Uh, uh, into one of streets or, or shared paseos for, for marketplaces. Uh, this is the, this would be the, 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 the street between the tight knit neighborhood and Broadway. So the, the street between the current Portland public school site and, and Broadway uh, that's leading you north to the educational hub. Now if we go to the next slide, which I think is the food hub. Can everyone see the food hub slide? Yes. So again, this is all just just kind of um, a vision framework, but um, it shows the kind of excitement and vibrancy that that um, that the, the team is imagining um, the, the relationship with the, with the skyline, with the with the Broadway Bridge, uh, the, the the hub serving as a major gateway to the community, but really kind of elevating, literally elevating uh, the importance of healthy food, um, education around food, partnerships um, with with local. Um, and a place for the, the community to come together, all ages, um, all, all demographics. So uh, these, these hubs play such an important role in the vision of the overall project. We go to the next slide. So the, the full vision fully realized, um, you'll see some, some higher density again to the south of the arenas that, that kind of help frame and bookend Waterfront Park. Um, and uh, again, um, as, as a, a fellow was talking about and Brie was talking about at the beginning, uh, this, this vibrant mix of uses from housing to um, commercial entrepreneurial spaces, uh, public, public realm uh, and, and hubs come together to form new vision for Albina all the way through 2050. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is one of my favorite slides and it's a, a slide that um, actually Bree and her team created to capture not just the, the, the plan, but really the, the, the spirit and the essence of, of, of Albina. And, um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these little, um, um, caption inserts are literally things that we heard during the, uh, the community engagement. Um, in my mind, this really sort of speaks loudly to um, Lower Albina would not be just a, a place um, for, for Black, Black Portland to live, work, and play, but, but also to, to, to thrive and learn and to, and to prosper. Um, it's, a, it's a place that in, in, in embraces multi generational communities um, and, and a place where uh, you can, can be around others that look and feel like you and, and that you can relate to, 
to your neighbors and, and your community members. Next slide. Just a few metrics at a very high level. Um, we're, we're talking about introducing over 2,000 housing units on 23.4 acres. Um, so that's a great start back to, to um, making this a, a thriving neighborhood again. Um, we're talking about, um, uh, about almost 300,000 square feet of, of commercial um, spaces much of which we imagine would be activated by local, uh, locally owned businesses and, uh, and locally owned black businesses. Um, and we're also talking about nearly 2,000, 200,000 square feet of, of space dedicated to community hubs um, spread across uh, the entire site. All right. So I think once again, we're pausing um, and uh, opening it up to council for any questions about the physical plan and the um, phases of implementation. I know we had some questions about the arenas, about... Um, could, could I maybe ask a, 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 a different, well, the same question, maybe slightly a different way. Um, you mentioned that Chris Oxley sits on your committee and he represents some of the, the spectator venues. Can, can you tell us where are the spectator venues with regard to the vision? Do they support the vision? Are they collaborating on the vision? Can you just give us some indication of where those conversations lie? Sure, so um, in our uh, earlier conversations with OMF in particular, um, it was really informational, and so in those discussions, we were sharing the progress, and then we took uh, feedback from them. And Sean, I mean, Josh can speak to how some of those um, were incorporated. I will say, across the city, our experience with bureau staff has been uh, hesitant to give uh, affirmative or not responses because they're really looking to you all to say what the position of, of the city will be. Ah, thank you. See, that's helpful. That is exactly what I'm looking for, is, is to understand where this council lies in this conversation. Because, uh, you know, as you know, but for the larger record, we're in negotiation with a number of these significant sports franchises uh, that, are, that are critically important to the economic development, prosperity, and livability of the entire city. And I just want to make sure that as this vision unfolds, somebody is working collaboratively with those venue owners and those sports teams to make sure that uh, as we move forward on, on what I think is really a glorious vision, that we don't get three or four more years into this and then find out that we don't have their support and we get into a tough situation where we have to choose one or the other. The council doesn't want to be in that position and future city councils don't want to be in that vision, that, that position. I think there's a real opportunity here for great collaboration. I just want to make sure it's happening. And if it's not, maybe there's a way this council uh, or uh, certainly I'm willing to personally engage if there's a way we can improve or uh, strengthen those ties. Yes, we will absolutely take you up on that, Mayor Wheeler, because um, as you will see, we will need a great amount of executive authority to speak on these issues um, and to negotiate the very complicated uh, considerations and decisions that have to be made. It is our intention to set up a scenario in which it's not either or, but there, is a, there are many points at which you will need to hold up the public interest, and this vision is our, um, is our presentation of how to do that. Great, thank you, and I appreciate that, Winda. Uh, and the, the other is coming back to the question I asked earlier around wealth generation, which, which you stated quite clearly is, is front and center as part of one of the key objectives of this project. And I agree with you. I, I, I think it has to be one of the key objectives. And we saw the, the really great dashboard. Um, that was a fantastic dashboard, the, the one that shows the trade-offs with low, medium, and high density. I, I'd actually never seen it presented quite that way. And uh, so kudos to you for doing that. 
But as you look at these opportunities around home ownership, around property ownership, around small business development, different densities suggested different priorities around how that wealth is generated. What were the conversations around the table and where did you land? So not to push it back one last time, but the last section will start with the slide that you like the most. Um, and the team will present exactly that. All right, I'm still gonna hold you to it. <laughs> I see what you're doing, Winta. <laughs> Thank um, you, Mayor. No, that's, that's great. And um, I'll, I'll wait for next steps for, for my, my other question. Thank you, appreciate it. And it looks like uh, Commissioner Hardesty wanted to jump in too. Uh, thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you for that uh, absolutely beautiful visual of what's possible um, as we think ahead. Um, you know, one of the things that occurred to me a little earlier was uh, why a community plan rather than a government plan uh, uh, or say a city plan. And, um, and it reminded me of the Albina Community Plan, which was adopted in 1993, um, which is not um, unsimilar to the big picture vision that the Albina Vision Trust is moving forward. I also wanted to remind my colleagues that the uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability in September of 2019 released a historic context of racist planning a document that really laid out um, the winners and losers, losers around economic development. Went to what I'm not connecting the dot on here is how does this new Albina Vision uh, uh, Trust Plan, when fully implemented, how does it ensure that people will continue to be able to live, work, and play in this new area? Because as you know, people are being uh, priced out all over the city of Portland. How do we make sure that this area is the exception? That's a great question, Commissioner Hardesty, and is also in our next section on wealth <laughs> and governance. Um, but I will give you a preview and say that what is different here in part is that there is an organization whose sole purpose is to act as equal partner in the implementation of the plan so that we're not just doing the engagement to say what it should be. We will be actively fundraising, bringing together the partnerships, working with you all and other public bodies on the types of legislation that will be necessary. Um, and so the way that the plan is created and implemented we think is what is different. And uh, could you also confirm for me, Winter, uh, I believe you have first right of purchase of the Portland Public School uh, Dixon Street property, is that correct? That is correct. And so that's, as you said, how many acres is that? So that building and the parcels of land around it are roughly 10, uh, 10 acres of land. Um, and so we are now, we've entered into a cooperative planning agreement with Portland Public Schools to take the work that we've started here and start uh, moving towards something that looks more like the required master city plan. Excellent, thank you. I'll wait for my other question to be answered in the next section. Thank you so much. Winter, hi, first of all, it's great to see you and thanks for being here. It's great to be live and the metrics that we all are, that one slide that we all like so much that looks at wealth generation and looks at home ownership, and then you break it down into density and mixed density. And I, I get what I'm looking at, but I'd love to know more behind how you came up with those, uh, the methodology for the determination of those metrics. So you don't have to answer it now, but when you get to that slide, because you're probably going to tell me we're going to dive into that <laughs> deeper. I just wanted to um, give you that heads up that I would like to, my, my head was hurting trying to figure out how you came up with those, um, with those metrics. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So maybe we should just jump to that. Cool. All right. Um, and as the team, oh, I'm sorry, there's a question from Commissioner Max. I'm eager to get out of the, uh, push this conversation along too, but I do have a question which I think is rooted in the material we just saw. Um, can we pull up a map that shows the general land use 
excuses for this. I don't think it necessarily matters any of the maps uh, um, that we saw uh, in the past couple of minutes or would do. So, so basically, I'm interested where the housing is going to be, where the park is going to be, where the food spaces are going to be. Um, and I think the whole maps got it. That. Yeah, Bailey, can you pull up the full vision? There we go. And maybe Josh or Bree, can you speak to this? stuff that we see on this map now currently zoned. One of the questions I'm thinking about is I think there's probably some industrial land here. Um, we always have to play anytime I take move, take away industrial land, I think I have to add it someplace else. Um, looks like you guys are looking for 23 acres of um, housing. How much for this project, how much industrial, how many acres of industrial land do we lose? Commissioner, I can take a stab at that. I don't think we're converting any industrial land with this particular um, area. The, there is some industrial land immediately north, um, just off the left side of the screen there. There's the Water Bureau facility. And you get into the lower Albina where the, the, the industrial uses are. But this area is largely zoned CX, or um, Central Commercial. So would it require, what kind of zoning, base zoning changes would, to move in this direction, would the council have to do? We, it's conceivable that the current zoning would allow this. We haven't gone to that level of detail in terms of, of, of that parcel by parcel analysis, but, but the, it, it may not require zoning changes so much as looking at the process and, and how we go through the master planning process. Okay, thank you. And Commissioner Maps, um, when you look at this map here, I do want to point out that the mid-density housing you see on the northern edge of the district is intimately tied to the wealth building obje objectives and the phasing that the team will walk us through next. Um, it's also when we look at the site where we see the greatest opportunity to create lots of accessible entry points for home ownership and the place where we can create that type of close-knit neighborhood that has um, that feeling <laughs> that people describe as, as being important to us. Um, on balance, this will deliver uh, the number of housing that's expected, albeit on that part of the site, the, centr the city contemplates higher density housing. And we're saying there's a strategic reason to approach it differently. wealth generation uh, or whatnot, and I know we're pushing those off. Uh, one question that I had that came up um, um, in the previous section that we could maybe answer in the next section is, um, I think we heard a little bit about um, rent-stabilized housing in the previous section. I'd love to learn more about how that works, but we can save that for maybe the wealth generation portion of today's conversation. Wonderful. And so as we head into the last section, um, I do want to point out um, on the page, can we go back one more time? Before we transition, are there any last questions, Commissioner Rubio or Commissioner Harsty or others, about the physical plan and implementation phases? I'll save my question. I have one. But... All right. Well, with that, let's actually just move to the last section. Uh, Mark Norman and Mike Wilkerson will take us through the wealth building strategies contemplated in the plan. Hello everybody, I'm Mark Norman uh, with Ideas in Action. Uh, I was very happy to work with the team. Excuse me, I, what are you doing at the table? Not here. No, Mr. Farley, it's not okay. This is the table for presenters during the work session. You're going to have to either Go back to your seat or you're going to have to leave. Mr. Farley, you can sit in any of these other chairs, not at the presenter's table. Can I ask you for my credentials, my 
you are not part of the Albina Vision Trust, are you? You're not on the board. You're not a presenter. So leave the table or we're going to ask you to leave. We'll take a five minute recess. We are in recess. Recording stopped.
The uh, delay, we're back in session. All right, um, Mark, are you still there? Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, all right, let's go back where we were. Oh, great. Um, so the wealth building was most exciting uh, for us and I see also for the other um, people in attendance today. So I hope I can answer a number of the questions that have come up. Um, but, but this chart that you see really came from uh, the community discussions, because so much of uh, community development and economic development can can fall to sort of what percentage of affordable housing might uh, you know a district or a new development have, and we really wanted to move beyond that. And I think you know the community engagement also assured us that that was also something that people wanted to see. So when you see these different densities, we really thought about um, the, you know, a scan of the local landscape of contractors, of owners, of renters and others, uh, and how they, the ways they might be able to uh, gain wealth and opportunity. And so um, when you look at low density, right, like individual ownership definitely is the path in America to, to wealth building, um, but it leaves a lot of people behind. So you might have people that realize wealth, um, but not a large number. So the, the higher densities provide more opportunity but as you get to those higher densities, you might lose some of the people that might benefit from um, the supply chain. So the larger scale contractors, uh, or you know, if you go to the highest densities, national developers and, and their construction uh, networks will be the ones that benefit. So that's why we really wanted a mix of densities uh, to encompass the people we had talked to in the development community in Portland, um, and also uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, uh, and others um, that might, you know, be at the scale in their businesses of building duplexes, fourplexes, eightplexes, small entrepreneurial hubs, uh, in addition to the large scale developments. So that's why you see this sort of the different scales moving at different densities for, for different people. And then in the next slide, um, you'll see that our process. Mark, I was going to I was going to chime in, Mark, real quick and just say that um, we talked a little about the hubs play a, a role and what Mark was just describing is that um, it's not just contractors that are working at their current scale and capacity, but the educational hub, for example, we've imagined that to be not just for youth, but also adults, for adults looking to scale up their businesses. So part of the reason we're proposing the educational hub in the, in the initial phase is to is to begin to upscale black businesses, small black businesses, to be able to participate in the larger density commercial uh, construction phases. So there, there is sort of a rhyme and reason to um, establishing the, the kind of mid density and educational hub as the catalyst phase. And it, it, it sets a platform for growth for local businesses to scale up with the project. Yeah, and, and we have wealth building stories that um, we both, real and uh, imagined people um, to kind of demonstrate the ways this might work. And you'll see that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, but in the next uh, slide, um, what you'll see are you know, some of the, the ecosystem of 
uh, institutions and people that might uh, contribute to that wealth building. And then, you know, most importantly, what the governance structure and financial mechanisms are that overlay on that to, to make this possible. Um, and so that includes everything from the small to, you know, large to small scale um, investors, uh, developers, um, uh, community development, financial institutions, social impact partners, and others um, that, you know, are part of a governance structure that actually allows that to happen. Um, and the next slide shows us um, part of that process. Um, so thinking about, um, you know, sort of a, a general process and then the process we uh, wanted to establish in dialogue with, with community stakeholders, which is, uh, as Othello and others talked about earlier, establishing the project values and programming and starting from that place. Then thinking about the, the tools and the possibilities and what governance structure might effectuate that. Um, and then thinking about the wealth building strategies um, that might fit to each possibility in terms of density, in terms of the way the, uh, the neighborhood is structured and the way uh, the typologies are laid out on the site that you saw in the last presentation. And one of the things we did, uh, and you'll see this in the next slide, is to think about all the ways one can build wealth. Um, so not just um, ownership, um, but also employment, um, what kind of community resources, it's, as Josh said, you know, the educational hub can play a role in building community wealth and community agency and opportunity, um, but also opportunity, um, you know, entrepreneurship. And uh, one of the other things that came out of the, um, the engagement process is that not everybody wants to live in Albina. Um, they have a tie there. They have family ties. Um, you know, they definitely... Uh, want to be a part of it, um, but how do they be a part of it even if they don't live there? And that might be through other mechanisms other than home ownership or even business ownership, but things like an ownership interest. And so we started thinking about the ways in which people might uh, have an equity stake, which also gives them a say in decision making for the long term, or, or the way they might, you know, have uh, shares of some sort or, or a partial ownership interest, um, you know, that, that's tied uh, more to sort of what their income uh, might be and how they might build wealth that way. And so these different mechanisms um, are sort of broad categories, but within that we have many different ways uh, that, we've that we've seen um, sort of across the country and actually across the world of how people can build wealth through a variety of means, not just, not just home ownership. Um, so when you look at those low, medium, high density within that, um, these are also sort of overlaid onto that. Um, the next slide uh, will show us um, sort of some of the stories that came out of the discussions and the engagement we have. And um, I'm going to let Othello um, sort of introduce sort of uh, these stories and, and sort of what they mean. And hopefully it also will show you some of the ways that, that both the, the plan, the density, the types of development, uh, and the partners um, can sort of combine to, to provide opportunity in, in Albina. Thanks, Mark. And, um, you know, just I'll back up for a quick second. You know, one of the things that we thought about when, as it relates to wealth creation is that a development like this, a, a, an initiative like this is really <laughs> its own economy, right? And you have to start an initiative or a project like that with, a really high level of intentionality about who is going to benefit most from that particular project. And so that's that's kind of the backdrop for the way we approach wealth building. The stories are really about uh, helping bring these concepts to life, right? And one of the, the, the best parts of the engagement process was these projects, excuse me, these stories were all sourced from residents who came to the community engagement sessions and helped us populate you know people that were familiar with them that might fit into this category uh, or this method of wealth building so these came directly from the residents uh, that attended the community engagement sessions next slide you know and this is one that is again going back to this idea of intentionality and starting at that very outset uh, of a project like this uh, you might have somebody like Darius, again, sourced from the community engagement sessions, uh, who wants to be an aspiring contractor. And on the, the right side of the slide, you'll see kind of the way that this project can support his development and growth uh, and the creation of wealth for him and his family. 
Uh, and so with all the following stories, that is really the perspective we took. How does this development serve the interest not only of small business, but also of the individuals that live, work, or, or, or play in Albina? So Darius is one of the easier examples to kind of get your head around, like people are, are really familiar with the idea of small business contracting and minority contracting. Uh, but on the right side of this, it really lays out how he might move uh, through this process and grow with it. Uh, and then I think I'll throw it back to, to, to Mark for the next set of, of uh, stories. Um, sure. So the, the Turners are, are, are another example. And you'll also see um, the right side and sort of a, an arrow or a kind of line pointing to where on the site um, this opportunity for, for this family um, might be might be realized. And so, you know, in, in terms of thinking about, um, you know, building wealth and ownership, um, right, it's, it's harder and harder for people to um, afford a home these days. So we thought about some of the sort of alternative means of ownership that, that might allow someone, um, you know, to enter that market. So the Turners sort of represent um, the different wealth building tools. So um, you'll see sort of in the box next to their picture, um, you know, uh, crowdfunding, um, rent collection, uh, and ultimately maybe an exit, um, but a way uh, to help a, a small family um, gain wealth. And so um, that's just one example. There are 10 uh, wealth building stories. Um, and uh, I, I think everybody has access to the presentation, but you can see in more detail uh, what those might be. And I might just turn it over to Mike Wilkerson to talk about um, some of the other stories that, that um, sort of we, we thought about as we, as we talked to people and actually as they gave us uh, some of the elements of, of these stories. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think just adding on to what Mark and Othello said that this uh, approach of thinking about people and their stories is a, is a marked difference from what you typically would see when you're approaching kind of visioning and master planning, which is really about buildings and feasibility and programming. And here, I think we, we kind of flipped it to be the, the other way around. It's, it's thinking about people uh, and opportunities that they would want to have, and then designing the spaces that would facilitate those wealth building opportunities. So these are, again, just 10 of many characters that we explored with specific details. But I think it really uh, revolves around, you know, the central idea that there's kind of these seven main uh, wealth building tools. And we, we have a mix of that that's going to come in at various phases of the project allowing for people to interact with the site as the site evolves over time. So Rocky is like an example of that, who early on might come into the, to the site in a rental unit, but over time, uh, there are opportunities at the hubs, et cetera, that he can continue to scale up and gain uh, valuable experience and interact with the site differently as it evolves over time. And again, there's plenty of detail here, but in, in the interest of time, maybe we'll keep going. And then similarly, as Mark mentioned, uh, you know, People interact with the, the site uh, starting at different different times uh, in in the progression. So in that catalytic phase, you know, as, as um, Bree and others have mentioned, the scale of that development is me is meant to be kind of an ownership interest and home ownership opportunities. But as we get into some of the hubs, there's where you can see more of the development uh, business development opportunities or entrepreneurship uh, collaboration and those types of opportunities for training. So it's really about uh, again the mix of these opportunities. Uh, in, in physical form that was leading the, this process. Next slide. All right, and back over for any questions. And there's there's just one, from what I understand, there's one more slide as part of ABT's presentation that I think um, relates really nicely to the content just shared. And so Winto was, had suggested that we just move through to that one um, and then yeah. have a conversation about the whole piece. Thank you. So in terms of next steps, and I think really the key is how to set up uh, a governance structure that's going to facilitate uh, the long-term vibrancy of, of the place, but starting with that catalytic phase. And so um, as I think was discussed already, uh, there's a first round of refusal on the Portland Public School site. And really this foundational phase is about preserving development opportunities. And that um, you know, can be first round of refusals or other options. And so this is really about talking with public and private partners about uh, how the vision can be enacted over subsequent phases um, and really starting to think about the individual tools that exist or tools that might need to exist to facilitate kind of a streamlined structure. So that's that first foundational phase. But really, as we get into thinking about development, it's about deploying existing tools. And so this is going to be, you know, a combination of tools. Uh, we did extensive um, 
research and looking for kind of comparable examples around the country, looked at, I think, 25 different examples. And what we found was no singular example kind of was able to execute the full vision here. So this is going to be uh, layering in multiple tools that exist and also the need to explore maybe programs that don't exist currently at the state or local levels. And so things like uh, Enhanced Services District or uh, LIDs or BIDs, special districts, I think the key is to, to find tools that can fund programming as well as facilitate uh, individual development and wealth building opportunities is really what that deploying existing toolkit is about so that uh, we can create kind of certainty around the division uh, development uh, with the vision that's been described here today is that second phase. And then the full implementation is kind of a, an opportunity to see how all the individual tools are working and kind of put together a comprehensive vision that allows for the, the, a functioning site over many decades uh, including the, the programming and funding of uh, wealth generating opportunities for future generations. So that's kind of what we're going to embark on in the second phase of this project, which is uh, getting underway here soon, is the specifics of all these details. Wonderful, thank you. So in a few minutes, we will um, have city staff do a couple slides on how this work aligns with some city priorities and potential opportunities for future partnership and collaboration. But before we do that, this is a great time for any remaining questions council have about their work. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I was glad to learn about the Metro EDA grant um, that you received for pre-development work on the Blanchard site. Can you talk a little bit more about what that work entails with that grant specifically? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so that grant is funded both by the EDA and Metro. What it will allow us to do is uh, the level of due diligence necessary on the Blanchard site and to take a look at the program that we've put forward to figure out what kinds of partnerships will be needed to acquire the site and move um, into development. So a, a greater level of detail. Um, there is a lot of work within that that will require city uh, collaboration. And I think some of the city slides will get into that too. I have a couple of questions. I don't know if this is the right time to ask. First of all, just to comment on uh, the wealth generating aspects of this. That was a great presentation. Um, that's very, very well done. And I appreciate the, the level of detail that went into that. That's that's probably one of the finer uh, analyses I've ever seen in terms of a, a development strategy and identifying the seven different ways that, that uh, wealth can be generated and making sure that it's intentionally put into the, the, uh, the overall vision. So thank you for that. Um, so these are sort of in a random order and maybe they're not in the right order. Uh, but first of all, Obviously, this is a significant long-term vision, and we all acknowledge that. Tell me about funding. Is, is there any discussion that you've had about the long-term funding of this vision? Are there any potential sources of funding that you're looking to specifically? Where are you in that conversation around the long-term economics of this project? Yeah, I will ask Mike to jump in here after me. Um, but just to give you an overview, we've been really successful at raising funds for Albina Vision, the organization, to allow us to be um, really a, a support, we hope, in building the city's capacity to do this kind of work. Um, in terms of the plan implementation, there's funding for Albina One, the housing uh, project. Um, there is also a lot of um, the city's $800,000 that we received in this budget actually allowed us to leverage it to a, a, a congressional request um, that we're waiting to hear back on for $3 million. I think you can look at the scale and scope of the Rose Quarter Improvement Project and see how that has been driven by the vision uh, laid out here. So it really, the, the question is, or the way to answer it really depends on which part you're um, asking about. Overall though, we do need to figure out how to fund the infrastructure to support 
this plan and the phasing is the way that we're thinking about how to prioritize that. So in this first phase, we're really trying to make sure that we have the resources to move forward on that waterfront park and to move forward on the um, close-knit neighborhood that is uh, on the northern edge of the district. The Metro and EDA grants are a step towards that direction. Um, and then big picture, uh, we recognize in that first phase of um, the governance slide that Mike showed, we will need to establish some kind of fund and think about what kinds of private public partnerships will um, will pay for this long term. Is, is there a part of your, pro and thank you for that, Wendy, is there a part of your project that is working overtly beyond the planning phase and onto the actual development of the vision? Is, is there any discussion around what potential sources of funding might be used for the actual development? I, I just find in my own work, and I'm sure you have through your work here, it's a lot easier to get development grants, planning grants, than it is the actual development of the project itself. And I, I'm just wondering if you've thought about that next phase, the actual uh, shovels in the ground phase, and if there's any particular sources of revenue you're looking to. Yeah, that's the phase that we're in now. Okay, is, is ascertaining that. Yep. Great, thank you. Um, then I think this question is probably for you as well, and I'm sorry to keep putting you on the spot, but um, I just have an organizational question. The Albina Vision Trust is being led by a largely volunteer group of outstanding individuals, and, and you've come in to help lead this organization's efforts. How do you see AVT actually growing or changing in the years ahead to uh, keep in lockstep with the size of this development strategy because it's big. This is huge. How, how do you see your organization changing or evolving? Yeah, you know, um, our move into development is the first signal that we recognize that and are growing into a different role. Um, long term, uh, there are multiple, um, the organization will need to take multiple forms. There is the uh, nonprofit entity that will be in charge of stewarding the vision. We will need to develop uh, the development entity that can implement this. And in this next phase of governance work, the work before the board uh, and our stakeholders is to define what that looks like. And actually in the community investment plan, the team has come up with some uh, initial recommendations about what that could look like. And so if you want to hear more about that, I'll invite uh, Mike or Mark to chime in here. Great, thank you. I don't have a lot to, to add to that, Mr. Mayor, other than to say that, you know, I think as, as Wynda mentioned, it's this delineation between the parts of the entity that are responsible for the vision versus the parts of the entity responsible for the uh, potentially ownership of land and actually executing on the development vision. And that's really part of this next phase of this project is kind of understanding what are the sources for that capital stack? What are one-time sources of funds versus ongoing sources of funds? Uh, where, where can those various buckets come from? Uh, public, private, philanthropic, et cetera. Because really the goal of that first catalytic phase is to kind of be an, an incubator of ideas for kind of mid-scale development around wealth generating. And it's not like there's a well, uh, a, you know, uh, a large examples of projects around that we can draw on to say, well, it's gonna be like this. It's gonna be a variety of projects that are all kind of new and innovative, testing the opportunities and how you can leverage uh, infrastructure uh, to promote wealth building. So that's really this, this second phase of the project that's gonna get into the specifics of all of that. Thanks, thanks, Mike, I appreciate that. And, and just as sort of a, um, a heads up, I don't like to be surprised. And so if, if there's an ask of the city, if there's a contemplation that there's a TIF district or something else, uh, we need to know sooner rather than later so that we can be productive and helpful partners in that. So that that's my, my one comment on that. And I'll turn this over. It looks, I think Commissioner Hardesty has a comment. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and thank you, uh, everyone who provided testimony today. Um, Othello, I think you were explaining uh, the wealth building component um, I, I'm wondering if you can go into more detail about the mix of uh, either land trusts. Uh, I, I guess my concern is I see opportunities for like the next generation, but I'm wondering about elders. I'm wondering about uh, folks who are already being priced out of the city of Portland. Um, and I'm wondering about how folks 
will be able to access uh, these opportunities and in, in this new vision of Albina. Absolutely. Um, so some of that is 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 going to fall squarely in the in the realm of that the governing body that uh, that that Mike talked about. Um, you know, preservation of the same opportunities that we're we're trying to create right, right now is is a major piece of of, of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, some of the financing tools that would be used to build uh, housing will will take care of some of that and and, and restrict uh, uh, who can live in particular places. Uh, but we absolutely wouldn't start this process with the idea of uh, of kind of replicating what's happening all over the country in terms of displacement and gentrification. Right. Um, and so we're still really early in that process. Uh, but the intent of of, of this team. Uh, is to figure out all the different ways that we can mitigate that and make sure that accessibility to the site uh, isn't hampered as, as, as we move into the future. But um, that's something that we're, we're really actively working on uh, moving forward, but we, we haven't gotten as deep into it as, as, as probably we'd like. I appreciate that, Othello. And uh, one other question for you. Uh, uh, I'm just gonna put it out there. I mean, uh, we're in Oregon. And we're talking about building wealth for Black folks um, in a state that was founded on exclusionary uh, laws that actually prohibited Black folks from living here. Um, and, <laughs> and, and I just have to say, if I, if I just looked at on the surface, like if you think about contracting opportunities or other, uh, those opportunities are, really don't exist in the kind of magnitude that would create wealth for more than one or two black households um, today, right? Not saying that it couldn't possibly sometime in the future. Um, I, 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 any advice on, I mean, what, how do we get a governance structure that actually reflects the historic nature of the exclusions uh, that have prevented wealth building um, and then have it be legally defendable? Uh, because of course, somebody's gonna sue us around uh, trying to create wealth for black folks. Well, I, I said, of course, I, I hear where you're coming from. I, I think just to take some comfort, like I, I, I work in a lot of cities that are very similar to Portland, where there are smaller or declining populations of black people, lots of small mid-sized cities in the Midwest and, and, and some on the West Coast. So it, it's, it's, it's a really familiar problem to us. Um, it, it's, it's one that I think ownership plays a major role in, right? When I talked about intentionality earlier, um, if you if you couple that intentionality with actual ownership, then you can set the tone for what happens in a particular development. Uh, if you don't have ownership, if you don't have the ability to dictate terms to large uh, interests, then there's there's no way for you to really see that through. But if you have ownership, you have intentionality, mm -hmm. you have a willing partner at the city, uh, you have a tremendous opportunity to be really catalytic going forward, but it takes all of those things really at the outset. And I, I really can't stress the intentionality that's required enough. Um, oftentimes you'll see a project like this start and 30% through the way, through the, through the project, people will want to get serious about opportunities for black and brown people. Yeah. Uh, and that's too late, right? right? It has to be from, you know, land clearing. It has to be from environmental remediation. It has to be every potential opportunity you see that lens of intentionality has to be overlaid. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, Winter, I have a, one question for you. Um, how do you. What is the timeline for figuring out the governance structure? This is the work that we're embarking in this next phase. So over the next three to five years, we're looking at the kinds of structures we need to create, the sources of capital that will be necessary, and then aligning that with the planning that's been done. Um, you know, I think it's important to remember that asserting that there is a vision for this district is an important first step. And while we've worked with the city, there's been no formal acknowledgement that this is the right vision for this part of the city. And so, you know, that is really step one to any of this, um, is making sure that that kind of control is, is established. 
Uh, thank you, Winter. And uh, one other question. Um, I, I realized that we started having this conversation when Charlie Hales was mayor, uh, was when uh, this vision was first uh, uh, articulated. Um, and uh, so uh, my, I guess my question, uh, I did have a question. <laughs> I think I may have lost it. Uh, my, my question is, um, what do you need from the city today? I think about uh, me having a Bureau of Transportation. I know transportation is gonna be a vital key uh, to this vision being realized. What specifically are you asking the city of Portland for today? Um, uh, that will actually give you confidence to continue to move forward uh, in phase two. Thank you for that question, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, you know, we do not like to operate with surprises. And so um, what you see in the presentation is exactly what we uh, are asking for. Um, in, this, uh, in this moment, we would like for the city council to accept a report that um, acknowledges that this work has been complete. We would like for you to pass a resolution affirming your support for this vision for Lower Albina. And then we would like you to, um, to direct bureaus who are waiting to hear from you uh, about what specific steps come next. Um, I, I know that's included in the bureau's presentations. Um, that will come next, but I will just highlight that our ongoing collaboration on the I-5 project is going to be critically important. Uh, there will be requests um, that we will need PBOT to help us think through the, uh, the needs for redeveloping uh, the Blanchard site as we will uh, the infrastructure bureaus. Uh, we need your assistance um, securing that waterfront park. But when we look at the big uh, picture, more than anything, we need your sharp uh, elbows when needed to protect the district from all kinds of interests that will emerge. We have a short window of time to move forward. And at this point, all we're asking for is affirmation that this is the right vision for this part of, of the city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know we have a, a few slides from city staff we want to get to, but I imagine there may be a few, some more questions from other commissioners. Okay, all right. Um, so I, all right, so I'm gonna pass it off to Lisa Abwa from Prosper Portland, who's gonna walk through just two or three slides on a city uh, alignment and future partnership. Well, and I want to make sure because I think there's a moment in time for so I'm Lisa Abwaf. I'm the director of development and investment at Prosper Portland. I'm going to apologize. We have to flip through and we wanted to just take a moment to set. I know Eric shared some around the plan planning context that Albina Vision Trust is undertaking this work, but also kind of share perspectives across a uh, cross bureau team that's coming to been coming together in support of Albina Vision Trust's work over the past couple of years, and that reflects prosper planning and sustainability, development services, housing, parks, transportation, et cetera. Really, when you're kind of um, thinking about building back a community in this way, it takes all of our lift. Um, and this slideshow starts to show some of the ecosystem of the city's work that we see as aligned with the priorities and the projects that are envisioned in the Albina Vision Trust vision. And I'd also like to take a moment and just compliment and thank Winta and Kayan and Cleo and the team because um, acknowledging that this has been a tremendous lift for them um, in undertaking a community visioning process over the past couple of years. And um, at a staff level, we thought we would highlight some really key and critical elements of the work that um, your staff um, and bureaus are undertaking in various areas. Um, particularly in support um, of the Lower Albina area and in partnership with the African American communities North and Northeast, as well as in East Portland. And in some instances, these are direct partnerships with Albina Vision Trust. In North Northeast, uh, as I think council is familiar, the North Northeast Neighborhood Housing Strategy and Prosper's Community Development Initiative guide investment of the city's 100 million plus of TIF resources 
These initiatives both prioritize people of color and in particular the black and African American communities who were impacted by urban renewal or displaced or at risk of displacement as a result of gentrification tying back to the various earliest and more recent policies, actions, and investments by the city in North Northeast. As Eric mentioned, PHB is also providing 13.7 million of our recent Metro bond. Um, measure funding towards a $50 million development the Albina Vision Trust is leading and that project, Albina One, will create 94 units of family-focused affordable housing um, and aligns with the uh, Housing Bureau's city's preference policy. So it does um, further the city's preference policy that is in alignment with PHB's other investments in North Northeast. This actually complements uh, support that PHB provides also to Central City Concern that does own an affordable housing project in the Albina Vision Trust area. It's the Madrona Studios. It provides critical clinical services together with 176 units, I think, of mostly studio housing. Next, we wanted to highlight that Portland Parks and Recreation is undertaking a partnership uh, with the Interstate Firehouse Cultural Center Committee as well as others including uh, Regional Arts and Culture Council to develop a grant program that is being funded through city um, council awarded federal <laughs> ARPA funds and this will support relief and recovery for black artists by providing free space at the cultural center and funding to produce work and present public programs at the center. And this is part of the funding that council provided for overall support um, for artists of color. Citywide, uh, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability has been working on the anti-displacement action planning, which documents the city's policy framework, tools, and programmatic efforts in support of anti-displacement efforts. And it also, um, BPS has been at the core of coordinating city bureaus to better align um, with our efforts and provide a path forward um, for more targeted solutions for historically underserved and marginalized communities of color, particularly black and indigenous communities. And kind of the next step of that, I believe, is around spatial justice projects um, that are ongoing as we think about how do we implement projects that really further um, those planning tools and policies. And finally, um, I think as Winta shared, clearly there is a close partnership that has been underway and will continue to be underway with the city and um, PBOT's leadership in terms of the I-5 Rose Quarter project that I think Art will speak to a little bit in the next slide. So with that, I'm gonna kind of tag team the next slide. These are some early thinkings, I would say, at the city, um, at city staff level about what next steps could look like and what partnership could look like with Albina Vision Trust going forward. I'm just going to jump in quickly. I know we are running pretty short on time at this point. Um, so maybe if staff could uh, find a way to keep your remarks a bit briefer than you were envisioning. Um, I don't know other council members, if folks have a hard stop at 1130, I think we have a little bit of flexibility on our end. Yep. This slide just gets to that transition from the vision towards the implementation and highlights a couple specific things within the geography. Just starting at the, at the whole geography, I think looking at the next steps to review the existing plans. I think there was a question earlier about that. The answer to the question earlier is we don't know the, the full details of consistency with all of our plans in the area, but that is one of our next steps to dive in to reviewing the central city plan and the, the comprehensive plan policies looking for consistency and alignment and, and also looking at the infrastructure needs. Um, we also already spoke to the, the continued coordination around the event facilities, the MOTA facility, um, Veterans Memorial Coliseum, and, and how they re retain their functionality going forward. Um, and I think Lisa will then speak more to the opportunity next steps on Blanchard and the waterfront. Sure, on Blanchard I would highlight, I think there's both infrastructure, I think this has been mentioned, kind of thinking about how the development inf interfaces with infrastructure and really how do you move into kind of the next phase of um, taking the vision to almost like a framework plan that then moves into a master plan that formally gets submitted to the Bureau of Development Services. It is a requirement for that site, so that is the direction we'll need to move towards. Um, and I think um, not only will it be important to look at zoning and what are the streets that will be needed, what are the utilities, but also what are the wealth creation opportunities that tag team up with some of the work that the Portland Housing Bureau is doing or Prosper does in support of small businesses. And then as we think about the waterfront, we wanted to highlight an opportunity, really dig into the opportunities and challenges. Property ownership has come up today, kind of the railroad has come up today. We think it's an important next step to really kind of dig in and understand what would it take from property ownership to investments to agreements to move forward to the waterfront education park. 
And with that, I will hand it to Art. Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very notable that uh, in addition to a um, compelling land use and wealth creation strategy, Albina Vision is also putting forth a really compelling transportation strategy. You will notice you did not see lines of traffic, huge sea of parking lots. What you saw was a neighborhood where it was thriving with pedestrian uh, use, public space that was, was welcoming and inviting and safe. Um, that only happens through really intentional design and layout, and that's where I think the Transportation um, you know, Bureau becomes in service to this vision in terms of what is the street grid, what is the, the, the um, cadence of streets and the texture of the streets and, and area that produces the type of environment that people feel welcome, feel belonging in. Um, and so that's one of our you know, key, first key actions together with partner bureaus would be looking at what does the ultimate sort of framework plan and then street plan look like that we can then be grounding parcelization into in terms of what the development would be. Um, of course, huge immediate action around I-5 Rose Quarter and the relevance of that and those parcels in terms of the street grids and, and the restoring of the uh, street um, connectivity. Uh, um, as well as what will be the use of the parcels adjacent to the, the, um, the bridge itself as well as the caps. Uh, and then lastly, Broadway Widler and its sort of key relevance as a spine coming through this area in terms of the green loop, streetcar connectivity and, um, and, and traffic circulation all become key elements that we'd want to work deeply with Albana Vision to um, come up with a, a strategy that can work and an investment plan that can realize all of those elements. So let, let me jump in on this, because I, I think you're on the right path here. I think we, we should uh, you know, leave with something intentional where we come back and make sure that we're continuing the work. And so yeah, I, I'd propose that we have staff come back to city council in a couple of months, either in a work session or just a presentation is fine too, or if we want to do it more, more casually, that's fine too. But I, I'd like to see a work plan start to develop specifically around city bureaus working with the Albina Vision Trust. And I think it, as you identify here, there, there's some easy first areas for, you know, I, I, I think that the Blanchard site master planning process provides a pretty obvious overlay between the work of the Albina Vision Trust and city bureaus. And I will be encouraging city bureau leadership to work collaboratively and develop some work plans, identify a staffing strategy, and come back to us with an intentional process for moving together in lockstep. Because I, th I think we're at that phase now um, where, where we really must commit to the longer term vision. And while we can't make any decisions today, I'm certainly hearing that you know, my colleagues, at least I'm inferring through their questions, they want to continue this work. Uh, and that's what I'd recommend, is come back to council in an open session and um, bring us, bring us that, that initial plan in the next couple of months. All right. I, just, I, I suggest that. I'm not telling my colleagues what to do here, but I, I think that's the right strategy. Commissioner Ryan, I don't know if you have a thought on that. I just want to acknowledge we are over time, but I think there is a little bit of cushion on some of your schedules. If I may jump in. Mayor, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Commissioner Hersey, jump in. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mayor, I think that that is absolutely the right uh, recommendation to make. I know that uh, in July, when we vote on the I-5 bridge project, um, it will be important that we are uh, uh, really envisioning how all these pieces fit together. Um, and since I'm talking, I'll also say I'm really excited about the potential uh, for us to utilize the waterfront in ways that we have not ever imagined uh, doing so here. Um, and this, this is a great opportunity to really start uh, 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 putting our stake down and making sure that as this vision gets uh, uh, further developed, um, that we have invested the right early resources to make it possible. And I will say that uh, the Albina Vision Trust has been a valuable partner uh, around the I-5 Rose Quarter uh, projects um, and will continue to be so. So I look forward to that continued partnership.
Thanks. Um, I wanted to start off by saying, first of all, it was so refreshing to have a presentation that was so bold and, and ambitious. Portland needs more of that. So uh, it's, it's refreshing to have a presentation like this. Thanks. And Mark, um, Othello, and um, Mike, thanks for the stories. That was very relevant and, and creative. And I agree with what the mayor mentioned, how it was, um, it was just a great presentation. It answered a lot of my questions. That, that, that said, it made me also think about the financial um, potential for contractors is different than the financial potential for an individual household that's not in the trades but wants to create wealth in a different way. So wealth creation is nuanced. It's not literal. It's not a linear process. That gets me to my final suggestion perhaps as you go forward is the, the board to come up with really good, more clarity exactly what success looks like. And I, I think from listening over a few meetings and then today that it's about wealth creation, it's about restorative justice, it's about um, obviously making right what was wrong, and it's building prosperity. And the prosperity for one community builds prosperity for others. Get it. But I think it, it will be important to have real clarity on what success looks like. Like what are the top three to five measurements so that we know as we make decisions that we're making decisions that support the vision of racial equity, which for me is always about um, creating next generational wealth. And so I just want to make sure that as you make decisions, we see that dashboard on where you're going so we can be aligned. That makes sense? All right, thanks. Commissioner Ruby or Commissioner Maps, any last questions or comments? No, I just want to um, acknowledge uh, and commend you all on, uh, on this tremendous amount of work. Um, it's a very big accomplishment over many years um, of you know sustained uh, dedication. So thank you for um, caring about our community to do this. Um, and I just, you know, I look, for, I think the next steps are the right ones. Um, I look forward to hearing the outcome of those discussions um, and uh, getting started. And um, I know we're, we're short on time, so I'll be brief. I want to thank everyone who presented today and everyone who supported the development over this vision over uh, many, many years at this point. Uh, the path forward laid out by the mayor and my colleagues sounds like the right path forward, too. Uh, so I look forward to um, the report uh, and recommendations that we get from staff. Um, and um, and just uh, and there's the other side of that coin. Uh, um, the next time we come together with the Abina Vision Project, uh, um, I would certainly love to hear a little bit more about how your discussions are going with um, some of the major property owners out there, uh, the the stadiums uh, um, and other venues in particular, and uh, the the school district building. Um, I feel like that is the obvious. Um, first development opportunity, or at least for me, that's a development opportunity that is, I think is uh, um, uh, long overdue. And so I would certainly love to partner with uh, the community in order to uh, find a higher purpose for that space. Wonderful. And I know we were a little pressed for time at the end here today. I imagine that Winta and the team would be happy to answer any follow-up questions so, that folks uh, have after. So we're going to lose our closed captioner in one minute and then we'll not be in uh, uh, alignment with state law. So if, if I could just jump in and say thank you. Thank you for a great vision. Thank you all for your leadership and your continued support of what I think is, is a, a huge, huge opportunity for the city of Portland. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I want to thank you specifically since you've been here the longest and oh, the rest continue. of you we can stay for, <laughs> <laughs> for your support. It's really, we could not have accomplished what we've done so far without your support. And we hope that that will continue. It, it will. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. We're adjourned. <laughs>